Thank you. Thanks for having me. And um, thank you, Eric, for laying a great foundation for um, the topic of my discussion, which is, as he mentioned, uh, efficient data reviews, both from the medical monitor perspective, as well as interrogating the data quality and potential fraud detection um, in data management and clinical trials. So, um, I guess an overarching theme of my presentation, similar to what Eric mentioned, is um, efficiently managing risk. So if risk management in clinical trials, and that's multifaceted. So we have different areas of where we can actually improve the process and quality of our clinical trial to have more efficient reviews and more efficient trials carried out. And part of that risk management looking forward is using the results and using the analysis that we can now take advantage of the electronic data capture and all of the, um, the, the new and updated transformations in terms of how our data collected is collected and use that to improve our clinical trials and the efficiency of our clinical trials in the future. So uh, my talk will kind of focus in two main areas of how to improve efficiencies with clinical trial review. Part of that will be focused on the medical monitor safety analysis review. Um, what kind of tools and what kind of analyses and efficiencies can we gain, again, using this idea of centralized data monitoring to ensure patient safety and conduct of the trial um, as it progresses? And a key part of this is the idea of ongoing trials. Trials continue to become more complex. We continue to get more and more data, and, you know, this is a continuous process. It's not like you review your data once but you have to review it multiple times, early and often in the trial, and you want to do that in the most, most efficient manner you, that you can. Um, so part of my talk will be focusing on the, the issues of efficient data review, um, specifically, you know, again, the data collection and how time-consuming that is, and what can we do to mitigate the risks with collecting the data as well as having time to analyze it. Um, on the other side, um, as compared to doing the monitoring from a medical standpoint, we really want to continuously ensure that the data quality is um, upholding the protocols of our trials and we have the integrity of the data that we would expect um, for something that's so important to our human protection. So some of the topics I'll touch for that section will be really focusing on taking advantage and utilizing electronic data capture and on-site clinical data monitoring. and. Um, like Eric had mentioned, one of the things right now that's so common and has been kind of a standard is to do 100% sort of state of verification, um, which is extremely time consuming and more and more as more recommendations from federal agencies come out, it's unnecessary and in fact can be less efficient and less effective than taking a statistical risk-based approach. So, as we all know, despite the issues that many of our clinical trials have, um, you know, the, a randomized clinical trial is still a gold standard, but one of the problems with that is that it's a gold standard specifically for interrogating efficacy of a trial. And one of the things and the complications we have, especially for those statisticians in the room, is how do we evaluate safety for these trials that have been de designed to actually interrogate efficacy? So um, with safety analysis, which needs to be our first stop to ensure the safety of our patients before we can worry about whether the drug is working, um, there's several difficulties to this, uh, namely that there's an enormous amount of endpoints that you're looking at repeatedly, repeatedly across time. Um, adding to that is the problem of rare events, um, detection of drug-induced liver injury. This is a very rare occurrence, one in 10,000 patients. So how can we detect that with our limited population for studying our safety um, measures during a medical monitor review? And um, I'll talk also a little bit about just some of the other limitations in terms of our understanding of the mechanisms and biological pathways. Um, our focus here is where we're at, but I want to continue to think of where we can go with it and what we can do with these risk-based approaches to improve the trials in the future. All right, so one of the things we can do just immediately to accelerate our reviews is focusing instead of on static listings and tables and an enormous amount of paperwork is drive towards the standard of using dynamic visualizations to either start as a summary view and then generate our tables and reports from that or use that as a tool ongoing throughout our medical monitor review. Um, another thing that will increase the efficiency of our review from a medical monitor standpoint 
is using the standards that have been put in place, namely the CDISC data standard. Um, by having the standardization of quality of, of, for our tables and all of our standard for our analyses, we can quickly surface tools that have capabilities to generate reports and reviews that anybody can use, clinicians, data managers, data monitors, statisticians, all from a standardized source. And again, statistics can't be ignored even at the initial stages of clinical trials where you do statistically driven analyses that provide that aggregate view but allow you to drill down to the patient level to understand all the data at either a patient level or at a trial level. So just looking back a little bit, um, it's been the standard IC from ICHE3 guidelines that the FDA released. Um, presenting all of our data in a standard static table has been, you know, the main practice that we've always gone from. But there's several problems with this. Even though it gives all the information and it may be the easiest way to disseminate that information, um, it's really hard to actually read these tables and it's really easy to miss signals because of them. So instead of looking at these static tables, we need to take advantage of, again, this electronic data capture environment that we live in and start with views such as a dynamic visual summary view that allows you to quickly highlight the issues of potential, in this case, potential adverse events that are occurring. So here, quickly from a graph, you can see that there's an enormous count for this adverse event. And then tools that allow you to drill down and filter um, let you get to that level of patient detail that you need, starting from a summary view. And now adding on more statistical considerations to that, it isn't just always a count and percent game. Um, applying statistical analysis early and often in a clinical trial can really drive the analysis, both in terms of just evaluating safety, but also, again, detecting trends or anomalies in your data. Um, so a space-constrained view that um, we found to be a good recommendation for both our customers and that the FDA has begin looking, begun looking at is this idea of looking at a summary statistical view that's performing a statistical analysis of comparing the incidence of certain adverse events um, versus the treatment differences. So our x-axis here, our x-axis here is um, a clinical difference in treatment in terms of the counts of adverse events, which we're comparing with using statistics to our y-axis, which represents the p-value or the significance, the statistical significance of that event. Um, presenting this space-constrained view, again, lets you really drive in on and hone in on the important events that are occurring during your safety analysis. And from that view, you can then drill down into these standard relative risk tables. Um, from our collaborations with the FDA, we often hear, oh, well, we want a table of the top 30 adverse events and their relative risks and confidence intervals. Well, you know, what is that top 30? Why is that a threshold? They might look at that table and say, actually, I want the top 50, or I only need the top 10. So instead of providing that static view, if it's driven from a statistical space-constrained results view, we can get to the information that they truly want for the reviews much faster. Um, so as, as the safety analysis continues, there are several more advanced statistical analysis complexities that we need to address. Um, again, one of the things is there's a lot of data, and big data, big noise. So how do we deal with the noise in order to pick out the truly interesting signals in our data? Um, part of that could be applying multiple testing te uh, methods, such as false discovery rate, or even some other ones that have been developed more recently that adhere to the known structure of, say, adverse events where you have body system level information. So you can apply a multi-level double FDR correction. Um, other customers have been requesting methods to do Bayesian analysis. So take the prior information that we know and build that into our model to understand the adverse events that are affecting our trial. And that's really key, too, because every trial is different, and every trial has a different expected safety profile. And that should be taken into consideration during your review. Um, some of the other complexities that you'll hit is just the recurrent events and the repeated measurements across time. So the inclusion of time windows in our analysis can help, again, accelerate our review and understand what's going on from period to period during our review. Um, other more complex issues could involve crossover. So how do we visualize crossover? 
Um, simple views can allow us to do that, and simple inclusions of treatment period to understand what treatment they were actually, a subject was actually on, can um, really add to the value of understanding the safety profile. And I will just give a pl plug here again, you know, where we are right now, we're already providing these tools. Several different companies can provide these tools, and pharma is taking advantage of it. The FDA is taking advantage of it. But where are we going? Um, a, a big part of this is we need to learn from what we're currently starting to do and build from it and use that to build predictive models to improve our efficiency and improve our trials in the future. Um, so part of that is actually taking this data not only to evaluate the current trial, but build in predictive models to understand how we can improve our trials in the future. Um, as I've mentioned throughout this, this is an ongoing safety review. So the, a key component of ongoing is understanding the changes across snapshots of your data. Um, again, the time consumption of just data collection requires that data review happen early and often before all the data is collected. And we don't want to have a redundant work effort, so having a tool that allows you to do snapshot comparison, meaning that as you get new data, you update your system, and you can quickly see what's been added, what's new, what's updated, um, stable records, et cetera. Um, part of that is allowing for an infrastructure that, again, allows for multiple views of the data. So data managers, data monitors, they might all be looking at the same data across time. So allowing for a notes infrastructure so you can make notes and track not only what has been updated, but track what's been reviewed and comments that you've made for that review can help as well. So understanding the review status of each clinical trial and who's been looking at that data leads again to efficiencies in understanding the safety signals. Um, continuing on with that, flagging, as, as we've talked about, again, flagging the data to quickly look at what's important, what's been updated, um, coloring, annotation of your data, that's critical for accelerated review as well. And at any time, of course, it is important to track that updated data and have that option to go back again to that summary level um, or the patient level of all the data for that patient. So again, that's our mantra is you start at a summary level, you understand the trends, you look at the anomalies, you see updated data, and you want to see exactly how that affects the entire patient review. So here we can have a patient profile that displays all of our safety metrics that have been um, collected, and then you can have options and widgets to only show what's been updated from the last review that you performed for this subject. Um, and these filters and these flags that you create from this snapshot management review um, should be used throughout. Uh, again, that's the beauty of electronic data capture. You have all the data there. You know what's been updated. Let's go back to our safety review, and we can quickly see and annotate our view based on only the met metrics that have been added since the last period of review. And tools like this really allow you to start comparing the data and the distributions of that data ongoing throughout our review. So across different periods of snapshot collection, we can see what's changed. And part of that as a lead into the separate component of my, my talk, which is data quality, is um, understanding, okay, is that change unusual? Are we starting to observe an unusual trend, trend or anomalies in our data from the last period of collection? And leading into that is methods that we want to query and wonder, okay, we, we see some anomalies. Is it just random error, um, mistakes in the electronic data capture, or is there potentially intentional fabrication of the data? And this is rare, but that doesn't mean that it should not be um, addressed. Um, and one of the things with this, again, going back to the uh, current status that we're in is we've evolved to the state where, because of centralized data monitoring, these kind of methods to detect unusual data anomalies are much more readily at hand. And it was a very good timing. Um, just in August, the FDA officially released their guidance speaking on centralized data monitoring and risk-based monitoring. And they include the fact that by using this, you can actually much more readily detect anomalies, including fraud or potential fabrication of data um, with these techniques. And I think these, this guidance and those that are also given by other regulatory agencies really, really good timing. 
Um, despite the fact that everybody's talking about risk-based monitoring, fraud detection, electronic data capture, it's not yet that well adopted. So we want to continue to drive those standards and drive those recommendations. Um, a current survey has actually shown that only about 33% or less of pharma are using the centralized data uh, monitoring techniques. Several of them, I think up to 80%, still rely on 100% source data verification. Um, this is in contrast to the more academic realm, which does use quite a bit more of the centralized med medical monitoring and data monitoring. And I think that was one of the purpose of the FDA guidance is to drive us towards using those methods when appropriate to uh, more efficiently interrogate the quality of our data as well as the integrity of our trial. So um, talking about fraud, there are some very straightforward tools that you can apply um, to interrogate potential fraud. Mainly this is looking to see if there's non-random distributions of your data. Another thing is really trying to look at at a particular site, is there a reduced variability, which could indicate that they may be copying data and reproducing it and changing it slightly. So by understanding the distribution of data collected from a site versus how it's collected from other sites can really help us target potential sites that have issues. So one of the views that would help us with this is a way to actually compare the um, similarity between subjects at a given site in terms of Euclidean distance. Here we're just doing a pretty straight distance metric. And um, often the investigators, if there is fraud, if they are intentionally fabricating data, most of them now are not, you know, are smart enough if they really want to do it that they don't just copy the data. They might tweak it a little bit, change it a little bit. And we want to be able to detect that too. So we don't want that to slide through. And that's really, again, looking at sites that potentially have very little variability at them or subjects that look almost identical based on their similarity measures. So these are just some easy views that take advantage, again, of that central data. Um, another key kind of component and straightforward analysis for detecting issues with data quality in terms of fraud is looking for duplicate or triplicate um, data across findings measurements. So one of the things you could do, for example, is looking at the vital signs. You can look for triplicates of subjects that have the exact same heart rate, diastolic, and systolic blood pressure. It might not be unusual for one lab measurement or one findings measurement to be exact, but when the, an entire test set of tests are identical across patients at a site, then we worry that you know, either there's been a data quality issue where you know, the same line got reproduced or someone has actually gone in and reproduced that um, and fabricated that data. So again, quick distributions, quick ways to summarize that and drill down into understanding the quality of the data from that site are key. And um, another kind of type of fraud that we can look at instead of Assuming there's investigator fraud where they may be fabricating data, we can also try to interrogate um, patients. So patients that perhaps the drug has a recreational component to it that um, certain patients might go to several sites and try to enroll multiple times. So we can try to detect that as well through some simple things like looking at birthdays and um, initials. So using some of the demographic information that's collected, we can try to um, find that and take um, measures against that early in the trial. All right, so now my lead into um, fraud is really just one component and one specific case of data quality in a clinical trial. There's a lot more to it. And again, fraud is rare, but data quality issues exist no matter what. Um, no matter how honest you're trying to be, sites, it's, it's an enormous amount of data. And we don't want to live in this world where we have to rely on on-site, 100% source document verification because it's simply not feasible with the size and the complexity of our trials these days. The, the component in terms of the cost is, you know, outrageous. It's, it can be up to 30% of the cost of a trial. And so what we really want to push for is, yes, trials need to be monitored, but that doesn't mean 100% source verification. Instead, you can apply statistical approaches to interrogate the risk um, for potential sites and target those sites that may need further visit or further study. So really pushing this can um, not only increase the efficiency and save us costs, but I think it can make it more accurate and increase the quality of the data. Um, again, it's difficult to find 
issues, and some of those issues might not even be important to the trial. Um, like Eric mentioned, you know, 100% source data ver verification, it gives equal importance to all the data. So someone come in and they, mis they, they misrecorded the age of a patient. That's given the equal weight when they're reviewing the data and they have to look at a piece of paper for that as it would be of whether or not they have a signed informed consent. And it's much more important to a trial if they don't have a signed in informed consent. So again, that's kind of the, the real impetus of risk-based monitoring. It's not just the cost saving, but it's the increase in the quality um, that we can get. So again, the FDA guidance really kind of um, is relying on the evolution of both the trial complexity and the evolution of, you know, software tools and electronic data capture systems and the technology that we all now live in. And it is now their recommendation that when it is appropriate, risk-based monitoring can be applied successfully and at times can pick up over 90% of the fi findings just from a central monitoring alone. Um, you can mix that in with targeted on-site monitoring to really efficiently understand the quality and ensure the integrity of our, tri of our trials. So um, as Eric had mentioned, one of the big initiatives right now is the um, Transcelerate group. And they've released a set of algorithms straightforward to implement based on creating indicators of risk that you can incorporate into your data quality, um, data management system in order to quickly um, review the data based on certain indicators that are coming in from the sites to know whether or not you need to target that site for further study and further visits. Um, the, another group that has been doing a lot of research and, and rec pro providing recommendations for this is the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative. And I, I really like the way they define quality. They say that quality is the absence of errors that matter. So it's not error free. We shouldn't aim to be error free. But we should aim to ensure quality in terms of the absence of errors that matter. And that's really why we want to do targeted statistical analysis using indicators that are weighted based on what's important to ensuring that quality and integrity of our trial. So by providing some type of indicator risk and using that in conjunction with our data management and data quality review, we can quickly flag um, sites and understand the data coming in from sites based on that mantra of ensuring quality in terms of reducing errors that matter. And um, these are just a couple views of ways you can create these risks based on a risk matrix, um, which were set forth by the Transcelerate Consortium. And you can have these risks, and depending on what you want to be looking at, say perhaps you're interested more in enrollment metrics or the occurrence of adverse events or the types of adverse events, perhaps the uh, frequency of severe or serious adverse events that are occurring, you can rate each site and have this, again, annotated, color-coded color um, framework that allows you to quickly assimilate and understand the data and know what, what areas have problematic sites, um, is there certain monitors where the data coming in from that site is an issue. And one of the things, again, to drive home the idea of this electronic data capture is you can take this information, you can look at these sites, and perhaps you can select either the problematic sites and remove them and then continue with your safety review. So this is a way that you really can start tying in the concurrent analysis of ensuring patient safety through a medical monitor um, review with the data quality review. So as data comes in, we can ensure the quality. If there's data that perhaps needs follow-up, then we can separate out that data and flag that data for further follow-up. But then we can also select those sites that are um, high quality and continue our review and drive, drill back in and drive back into the summary, summary views and aggregate views for those patients where they have high quality. Another example of ways to apply risk-based monitoring um, is through findings analysis as well. So you can, by looking at site level, you can try to detect unusual trends of measurements for findings that are coming in from different sites, as well as just interrogate the baseline values. So given all the baseline values from certain sites, are there already from the get-go, before there's even treatment, sites that have issues with the measurements that are being taken and recorded? So again, all of this is just taking advantage of the centralized monitoring mantra in ways to improve the efficiency and quality of our data 
um, in an ongoing review. So to conclude, um, I think this really is a combined effort of data managers, statisticians, clinical monitors. We all have to work together on this ongoing review, and it's key to lead with statistically driven dynamic visualization. I think this is critical for efficient review from both the medical standpoint as well as data quality. Um, one of the key things that we've found with our customers and with working with the FDA is relying on data standards like the CDISC model really um, opens up the tools that clinicians, biostatisticians, managers can use in a standardized format. Um, and again, I think the take home from both I and Eric's um, talks is use the centralized data monitoring. It's there because we have that technology now and the complexity of the trial is creating so much data, it's necessary. Um, one of the big things anybody in statistics is studying right now, it's, it's a very big trend, which is the idea of big data and big analysis. And with big data comes a lot of noise. And we have to provide tools that allow us to really pick out the signal from that noise. And I think that's where we are now. And the next steps forward is not only pick out that signal, but understand that signal and use that signal to perform prediction and improve our trials in the future. And uh, I'll conclude there. And thank you. And any questions I'd be glad to take. you drive the questions. Yeah, so um, just to repeat for those that couldn't hear, the first part of the question is, um, is there a need for further regulatory recommendations for data analysis um, in the review? Is that correct, for the first part? So um, I'll answer that part first, and then I'll proceed to the second part. I, I strongly think there's need. I, I mean, I, we rely heavily on the FDA guidances that re are released, as well as those from other regulatory agencies. Um, Speaking again to some of the things Eric showed, we rely heavily on the FDA guidance specific to interrogating drug-induced liver injury, which has several um, recommendations for standard analysis techniques that can be performed. Um, likewise, the current guidance on risk-based monitoring. Um, it's really more, it's not getting into the statistical qualities as much, but I, I think there's definitely a continued need for standardization and guidance and recommendation for those analyses. Um, leading into his second part of the question, um, which was kind of more of an audit trail and, and culpability in terms of the, the tracking of an analysis versus just exploration of the data. Um, that too, I think, is key, and we have all the tools to do that. So um, some of the things we've been working on really heavily are creating standard reviews. So we kind of live in this mantra that perhaps there is a statistician doing all the data exploration, which we completely track any, any analyses that are run, and we save logs and information like that, and I think that's critical. Um, but at the end of the day, when they have done their full review, they can create a workflow or a review package that can be, then be sent. And we envision, you know, again, with the tools that people can use and create, the capability of that is really, 
we could imagine a case where a statistician performs a review, hands it off to their medical monitor, they can quickly go through the review looking at each of the steps they took, and then that same review could be packaged and sent straight to the FDA so that they're looking at the exact same data and the exact same review as it was performed. And I'll repeat your question, <laughs> if I can hear. <laughs> um, my name is Mike Cameron from Kiwanaka, and we, I, I'm qualitative department rather than doing qualitative process management. Um, we've been faced with the same problem during the audits going on in large international studies, and um, we got over it on the, in a similar way, but probably not as sophisticated way. But we had to, we probably had to plan. Mm -hmm. um, there was always this question about you know, interim analysis. You, know, you, you, had, you, did you care up front about interim, interim analysis? Mm -hmm. Right. This is the data. These are the data sets that we would look at. Right. And um, you know, and they, they would run from primarily the set of things that we see, or some sort of medical things, or mm -hmm. sort of main purposes, rather than general set of data. Mm -hmm. But we, we do it for things like that. But we, you know, we're faced with a great deal of data to look at. Right. Um, What was set out in the, yeah. Yeah, and I think, I think that is a really key point to make. So what he's talking about is can this, all this interim analysis and exploration of the data kind of distract from the plan set forth prior to the beginning of the trial. And um, I see that as actually one of the purposes of this exploration. Um, w as you start your trial, you should adhere to protocol and adhere to the study snapshots. And of course, there is a lot of research into adaptive trials, but again, that's planned interventions. Um, part of the, in terms of the first part of the talk, the safety analysis has to go be ongoing, and we have to be reactionary in part to that if something comes out. But we shouldn't live in a reactionary world, and we really should try to become proactive. And I think part of this exploration can be used in order to use these risk-based approaches to better design upfront the expectations of our next trials. So use what we find to do exploration in the terms of predicting um, the outcomes and, the sim and do simulations by using this risk-based analysis to better decide protocols and when to do snapshots and when to do views of the data with our next trial. Um, does that answer your question to a way? Yeah, de declaring, and I think at the, the place we're at right now is part exploration, but part using that exploration to better ensure that we are declaring a priori instead of reacting to results. Um, and I will mention to that, going back to the need for further guidance, I think the FDA mentioned in their risk-based monitoring guidance the need and the recommendation for quality by design, um, and that's something we're looking into as well, and I, th whoop, I think Eric wanted to add to that, since he, yeah, he missed out on the question part.
know over here is they're very clever CRAs and they can look at other um, variables um, and guess the bar. So, so Steve was very interested in the ability to um, hide certain variables from you during during the regular review. And he's suggesting also that if you if you know these up, up front to make sure that you, the tools that you're using do hide those variables and that you put in the documentation that you sent to the regular jury to use it, which variables you thought those were and um, and said that you had hit them. And that way you, you try to prevent as much as you can um, giving away the blind because you know that uh, when the CRAs talk to the sites and they have a sense of which which patients are which treatment they might might be uh, yeah. So yeah, I agree. That's a concern. I think if there's time, yes. <laughs> Until they kick me off, I'm here. <laughs>